The next morning, Luther was missing. The father walked out into the field, and there he found the boy wrapped around that potato hill, just as close as he could get to it, sound asleep. When he awakened, he said, Papa, Jesus talked with me all night long, and he told me that if I would watch that little bulb until it ripened, take it and preserve it, and plant the seed next spring, then when it developed, there would be one potato there that would make me famous. And that is just what happened. Luther Burbank also worked with the cactus. He took the prickly pear and put it into a glass cage where it would be protected. For five and a half months, he sat before that case one hour each day and talked to that prickly pear something like this. Now you are protected. Now you don't need those spikes. Let them go. In seven and a half months, the spikes had dropped off. He had the spikeless cactus. Luther Burbank used to say, Why, I walk and talk with Jesus, and he with me. He teaches me. He tells me what to do. F. L. Rawson, R-A-W-S-O-N, was a brother of Sir Rawson Rawson, one of the great engineers in England. He was called in by the Daily Mail to investigate Christian science, and he did such a remarkable work that they were all astonished. His first statement was, There is nothing but God in God's perfect world. Man is the image, the likeness, passing on God's idea to his fellow man with perfect regularity and ease. One day, when I was visiting Mr. Rawson in London, we stood at a window looking out across the street. In London, years ago, they used two-wheel carts drawn by one horse. Construction work was in progress across the way, and a horse pulling a two-wheeled cart came down the street, halted, backed up, and the driver went to the back of the cart. And suddenly, before the eye could catch what happened, the box turned up and tipped the whole load of rock right on him. F. L. Rawson's statement was, There is nothing but God. And that man seemed to come right up through the rocks, and he didn't have a scratch on him. Another thing happened in that same connection. The horse didn't do something that suited him, and the owner started to beat the horse. All Mr. Rawson did was to tap on the window to attract the man's attention. That horse immediately walked over and put his nose up against the window. F. L. Rawson took 100 men into World War I and came out without a scratch on any of them, and they went through some of the most rugged assignments. He stood absolutely for that statement, there is nothing but God. We can go on and state almost indefinitely what happens as we take the right attitude toward a thing. Now we know that if we stand off and look at a thing and say that it is impossible, the very next thing you know somebody else will come along and complete that in a short time. That has been so with practically everything. Alexander Graham Bell was a good example. Our family knew of him very well. He lived in Jamestown, New York. He walked 60 miles from Jamestown to Buffalo, New York, to contact my father and his two brothers, who were small bankers in Buffalo at the time, and asked them to let him have $2,000 that he might attend Boston Tech to perfect his instrument and install it in the Centennial Grounds in Philadelphia, in 1876. They let him have the money. When the directors of the bank learned of the loan, they came to my father and uncles and asked for their resignation. They were so sure Bell would never perfect his telephone. Booths were installed at the Centennial. People could pay a nickel, go into those booths, and call up and talk to their friend in another booth. And that little device created such interest that it paid more money than anything that was installed at the Centennial Exposition. You see, we close our thoughts and we lose the benefit of them. Alexander Graham Bell was really a wonderful character. The reason he didn't have any money was because he was always helping the blind. He spent every bit of money he had to aid the blind. Dr. Norwood used to tell his little congregation that he would go for a walk out among the timber in back of the church, and there Jesus would join him, and they would walk on and on together. Dr. Norwood had a small church up in Nova Scotia, at a little place where there were only 29 fishermen and their families in the village. Somehow word of this got out, and we heard of it, and went up there with the idea of taking photographs. We took the pictures on a Bell and Howell 
camera with ordinary lens and we have those pictures today. Sometime later, Dr. Norwood was called to St. Bartholomew's Church in New York City, and in less than five months that church was so crowded that they had to put loud speakers outside that all who came might hear him. One Christmas season during a healing service hour at the church, Jesus was seen to walk out from behind the altar and pass right down the main aisle of the church. I talked to over 500 of the people who were gathered there and saw this happen, and Jesus' salutation was, Prepare to put love forth to the whole universe. The Chilas in India have a very beautiful prayer, which you will note is not a beseeching prayer. I go forth this day in all things, immersed wholly in God and God's abundance. The conquering Christ stands forth, one with God's abundance, and in every activity of this day. Now I know that I am God's supreme child. I move each moment of this day immersed in God and God's divine love. God, 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 the great flame of love flows through every atom of my whole being. I am the pure golden flame of God. I pour this divine flame through my physical body. The conquering Christ salutes you, God, my Father. Peace, 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 the great peace of God prevails.